So this is one of Charles, Charles' sermon. So we're, we're going to be in, so open your Bibles. If you have a Bible, if you've got one, if you've got your Bible, open it up to, to John 1. And I love this sermon that Charles preached. He actually preached several sermons just in John 1, and I plan on doing the same thing. So we'll be in John 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came to visit, came to witness, testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe he himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming to the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was no, which was he came to, to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent nor of human decision or of a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory the one and the only Son, who came from the Father in the full grace of truth, and full, full of grace and truth. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the word today. I ask that everything I do bring glory and honor to your name. In Jesus' name, amen. So again, I have to give Pastor Charles credit for, for, for the sermon. I use, I'm, using his, I'm using what I transcribed from his audio. Uh, but it's a beautiful sermon, uh, as you all probably already know. Jesus was both divine and human. It's amazing how quickly heresies grew uh, up from the church. One of the worst is what is known as, as Gnostic heresy. It comes from a Greek word called knowledge. These are the people who had made an open profession of faith in Christ and had joined the Christians, but somehow they missed the mark. And they began to talk about other things. They thought they brought philosophy into the theology and uh, that's always a bad idea, church. So some of them said Jesus was only human, and he, he was not divine. Jesus was a result of a great force of the universe that made emanations of itself through angels, which emanated other angels, until finally, way down the line, Jesus had emanated. So he's so far away from God to only be human. But others heretic ways, they said this, no, Jesus was only divine. He couldn't be human because humanity is a part of nature, and nature is made of matter, and matter is all evil. Where do they get these notions? Well, they got them from the philosophers of the time. You remember when Paul was reading about, uh, was, visit, was, was visiting Athens, he went up on Mars Hill, and he talked to all those smart guys up there, and they all had ideas. None of them were actually very good. But they had a great influence throughout the world. And so they influenced these so-called Christians. Some of them believed that Jesus was only humans. The others believed that Jesus was only divine. But I've come here today to church to tell you that Jesus was both human and divine. He's both. He was both. He is both. And uh, next Sunday, we're actually going to talk some more about, about that. But today, I want to emphasize on the divinity of Jesus. He is as much God as he, is, he had never been man. He is as much man as he had never been God. There never was anybody, and there never will be anybody like Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away sin of the world. Yes, because he is the only one in the universe qualified to do that, Jesus Jesus loved to identify with us as a human being. But little by little, he let himself be known to his followers. And towards the end, he was very outspoken about who he was. As the Son of God, as the second person of the Godhead. And so they said, he's a, they said he was a blasphemer. He made himself equal to God. 
He didn't make himself equal to God. He is equal to God. This is what the scripture tells us. The word was with God and the word was God. We have a hard time explaining that to people who don't, don't want to believe it because it's a doctrine that we accept by faith and we readily admit that we don't completely understand the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all God, all part of each other. So Charles actually, there's a beautiful story of, of, of a Jew, Jewish man, a complete Jew. I don't know what a complete Jew is. That's one who accepted Jesus Christ. Um, and he uses an egg to describe the Trinity. And he said, what does this egg represent? He said, you ask any Jew, he can't tell you. They don't know what it represents. But he said, I'm here to tell you that it represents the Trinity. What's an egg, church? It's, it's a yolk. It's got the white and it's got the shell, right? It's three things. But, I'm, but if, I, if, I, if I was holding the egg up here, it'd be one thing. One egg, but three descriptions that fit and apply it aptly, and it's all part of the other. It all goes together. Charles said, I never will forget that, and it's an oversimplification. But he says, I don't know, it helped me, it helped Charles, and it helps me to understand the Trinity too well. About God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But what we're talking about here today is God the Son. Okay, he is divine and he is God. And so I want to give you ten reasons why we believe Jesus is, is divine. So that's that's ten reasons, y'all. So that's uh, that's ten minutes for each each one. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, but Brother Charles, he used an example, and I'm going to use it too, is that for most of us know that Charles was born in 1930, 32, I believe, 32 or 31. Uh, but he was looking at a newspaper, uh, and the newspaper was from the 1920s. And um, he says, I, I looked for my name there, but I wasn't there. You know why? I wasn't there. <laughs> In fact, you asked me where I was at the time. I was nowhere, is what Charles says, because he was born in 32. Now, now, it's hard to believe that about yourself. There was a time when, when you and I didn't exist. Okay? So it's humbling. It's a humbling thought, isn't it, to think about that? There was, I mean, I, I see pictures of myself when I was baby Brandon, and, and my mama, mama remembers me in the womb, but there was a time when I didn't exist. If you go to 1978, 1979, I, I wasn't there yet. So Jesus doesn't fit that category, y'all. He always is and always was. He has no past. He has no present. He has no future. He is. Everything is now to him, and he was born at Bethlehem as a little baby, born a virgin, but that was not his beginning. That was not his beginning. He came from heaven. We read that in the second chapter of Philippians. You know, it's almost a mystery how, how God could become a man, and it's almost on, but we, well, it's unbelievable that, that God, the God of the universe, would come down to this tiny little planet, hurling around in its own, own little solar system to become one of us, identifying with us. But who did this? God did this. The Word was God, and the Word was with God. And he's holding the whole thing together. God is. You know, you just can't say, you can't say too much about the majesty and power of Jesus Christ. You cannot say too much about it. So here, here's ten reasons, ten of Brother Charles' reasons why Jesus is divine. One, we know that Jesus is divine because he existed before he was born. And we just talked about that. Two, we know he is divine because he was born of a virgin. Anybody here born of a virgin? Now this is not casting aspirations on, 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 on your mother or, or my mother. This is just saying that nobody here is ever born of a woman who has not known a man. But there was one person who was. His name was Jesus. And it's hard to believe, isn't it, that, that 
what we know about genetics and science today, that all that we, how far we've come in scientific terms, it is it, 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 what is known as the fact of life. When Jesus was born, he was born of a virgin. What is the point of, of the virgin birth? You now get this. The point of the virgin birth is that the Holy Spirit is the one who came upon Mary and caused Jesus to be born. He had no earthly father. Now, wait a minute. Now, now in the Bible it says that, that Joseph was Jesus' father, right? Because he was his adopted father. We do that today. People who were adopted children claim them as their own because they're their own legally. So legally, Joseph was the person who put his name on the certificate and the forms. But God is God. Jesus was not born like anybody else. He was born of a virgin, and that's an important doctrine. Now we're on three. We got, we got, we got seven more to go. Eight more to go, technically. We believe that Jesus is divine because his life fulfilled prophecy. You want to do an interesting study? Look in the New Testament and look at the words that scriptures might be fulfilled. You will see that several times in speaking about what Jesus did with his life. It happened. These events took place because the scriptures have predicted that they would. And Jesus fulfilled scripture. Nobody else has ever done that. So we believe that Jesus is divine because his life fulfilled the scriptures. Four, he healed people, blind people were made to see. Lame people were made to walk. Deformed people were made whole. Possessed people were made free of demons. He performed miracles. This proves to me to be one of the things that tell me that he is like nobody else. He is divine. He is God. Number five, he has the power of God. Because he came to fulfill his mission on earth, God had a plan and it involved the sending of his son, to give himself as an atonement of our sins. This is something that Jesus gradually understood as he grew. When he was 12 years old, he had a pretty good idea of what it was. He had a good idea that he was different because he told his parents after they found him uh, lingering in the temple, I must be about my father's business. He went about in the wilderness and was tested by Satan and overcame every great temptation that Satan laid before him. Only the Lord is able to do that. When he was confronted in the Garden of Gethsemane, who was afraid that night? Those people who came to arrest him. When Jesus spoke, they all fell backwards because Jesus is divine. We believe he's divine because he led a sinless life. Anybody here lead a sinless life? <laughs> some of us think, that some people might think we do. But we have not. Oh, yes, that's what the scripture says. He never committed a sin. H how do you live without committing sin? We, we found that impossible. But Jesus found it very possible because he is divine. Jesus never prayed a prayer asking for forgiveness, but he taught us how to do that. He, he was the Lamb of God without a spot, without blemish, and perfect sacrifice. He never sinned, but he offered himself as a spotless Lamb of God for our atonement. Seven, we believe that Jesus is divine because he claimed to be our master and our Lord. On the night that he betrayed, when, when he was meeting with the disciples, he said to them, You call me master and Lord, and you say, Well, because that's what I am. It's a claim that he made for himself, and no serious study of the life of Jesus is going to discount these sayings of his that declared him to be God. Eight, we believe that Jesus is divine because he rose from the dead. Nobody else has ever done that. And as we get to Christmas, we get to the center point. We're getting closer to, to Christmas. We're getting to the center point of our faith. I'll say this every year, and it doesn't get old. Nobody else in the history of the world has ever, one, predicted their own death, and conquered their death and made alive again. But Jesus Christ, I don't care how nice Buddha was or they say he was, Buddha never did that. Buddha has nothing to do with the Son of, with the son of Man and has no, no place being compared to him. 
Mohammed, Buddha, are very, very dead. And they remain dead today. Jesus is alive. He's made alive and will be alive forevermore. We believe that. Jesus is divine because he rose from the dead. And nobody else has ever done that and nobody else ever will. We believe that Jesus is divine, Sister Kay, because he's coming again. Because he promised that to us and he will keep that promise. Titus 2.13, it speaks of the glorious appearing of the great God and it's our Savior, Jesus Christ. Many people doubt that, but I'm telling you, there won't be anybody doubting that day when he comes back. Well, when's that going to happen? We don't know when that's going to happen. Nobody knows. So they ask, they, they, ask, they ask Jesus point blank just before he ascended back to his father. He says, not for you to know. Nobody knows. Only one knows, and that is the father. I don't even know. So if Jesus didn't know, I'm wondering how, how some of these guys that they write these fancy books predicting, <laughs> they predict the end of time. And they must get really embarrassed whenever, <laughs> whenever 1999 rolled by, whenever 2000 rolled by, whenever 2012 rolled by. How embarrassing. <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad they got it wrong. But, I mean, you know, I mean, you're really rolling the dice. I mean, you're really fooling yourself when you think you can predict the end of the world. We cannot. But what Brother Charles emphasized, and I want to emphasize again today, is that that's not important. The time is not important. What's important, it shouldn't matter to you and me, but what matters is that he's coming back just as he promised. That's what matters, okay? And, and, and ten, finally, we, we, we believe that Jesus is divine because he shall be the final judge of everybody. And I'm here to tell you today that God loves you. God loves you, okay? Sister Brenda, Brother Carl, Sister Charlotte, everybody here, God loves you. And Jesus died for you, that in the love of God, salvation is being offered to you. But the day is going to come when he sits on that great right throne, when people are going to say, let the rocks fall on us. The day will come when Jesus is no longer appearing before us as Savior, but as judge. We better be ready. I'm telling you, when Jesus returns, he's not going to send a message ahead of time saying, Hey, y'all, better get ready. I'm coming. Because guess what? He's already said that message. He's already sent the message. Be ready. I'm coming. He told us that already. So get ready, be ready, and stay ready. And what Billy Graham said, I love Billy Graham here. I still love Billy Graham. Charles loved Billy Graham. Charles loves Billy Graham. Well, Billy Graham says in one of his sermons one night, he was asking us, as this is Charles' words, remember, he was asking us, is your luggage packed? Is there something else you can think you're going to have to get ready to do to meet Jesus? If there is, <laughs> do it now. <laughs> do it now before he comes. You know, he is the one Savior of all mankind. He's my Savior. I know most of us, practically all of us, have accepted him as Savior here. But if you haven't, he can be your Savior. If you're watching right now on our, on our feed and you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you can make him your Savior. Jesus said, you'll be my witness in Judea, all of Judea and Samaria, under all the uttermost parts of the world. In other words, he wants us to tell others about him. And so, that's what I'm here doing, y'all. I'm telling you about Jesus. That's all I'm doing. The very first sermon that I preached here in January of 2020, the late Johnny Melton, he told me the same thing. I said, Johnny, what a... I'm a little bit nervous. I don't know what I should do. <laughs> That's what I said. I said. I'm trying to pray what I should do. He said, just tell him about Jesus. And that's all I'm doing is telling you about Jesus. That's all Brother Charles has done. That's all that most of the preachers that have come up here and done is tell you about Jesus. It's not rocket science. It's simple. Jesus is coming soon. doesn't matter when he's coming. 
All that matters is that if you and I are ready, he's already sent the, so he's already sent the message, y'all. When I send my mom a message that I'm coming over to her house, that means that I'm already coming. I'm, I usually don't call her and say, Mom, I'm coming again. I'm already on my way to eat dinner. So, Mom, have dinner ready. <laughs> or have lunch ready. I'm getting hungry. Are you all getting hungry yet? I'm just kidding. <laughs> you married a Baptist pastor. Uh, <laughs> our, 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 our stomach is an eternal pit. <laughs> but be ready, y'all. Most importantly, make sure that those that we love are ready, too. Those kids, those grandkids, those great-grandkids, they got to be ready too. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the word today. I thank you for, 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 for Brother Charles allowing me to, to preach one of his sermons here. And I, and I, and I pray that I, I did you a service and Charles a service too as well. It was an honor to preach that. I thank you for, for, for the many years of service that he's had, and I thank you for, for the service that I have here too as well. But we most of all, we thank you for you, Jesus, and everything that you do, Lord. We pray that we are ready for you and that we are willing to, to, to sometimes, sometimes we need to change a lot of times. There's things that we need to change or get rid of in our life to, to, to make sure that we're fully ready for you, Lord, and that, that we're ready to come. Now, we accept you by, by grace and by faith. We're not by our works, but this is faith in faith. This grace, it makes us more like you. So we pray that we conform, be conformed more like you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I dare not end a sermon without offering a lifeline. If you don't know how to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, please make a profession of faith because tomorrow is not promised. If you want to do a rededication, if you want to rededicate your life to Jesus Christ, we can do that too as well. If you want to, if you feel like you're being called to the ministry, come on up. If you want special prayer, come on up. If you're interested in joining this church, I think everybody here is a member, uh, but we can check on that too as well. But please type in type it in in the feed too as well. Thank you. Let's stand together.